Hello boys and girls, and welcome to Karen Reads. I'm in my living room again in South Berwick with a book called Lobster Boat. That's something that all of you probably know a little bit about. It's written by Brenda Guberson. And when she was a little girl, she wanted to become a jungle explorer. And that didn't work out for her, but she explores now by doing research. So she's written books about all kinds of subjects that she's researched through books and the web, etc. The illustrator is Megan Lloyd. She's done more than 40 books, including one called The Little Old Lady Who Was Not Afraid of Anything. All right, lobster boat. The early morning is crisp and cool and dark. A fog touches the tiny town on the coast and blurs the warm yellow lights in the houses and the red-orange leaves on the trees. Two dark figures glide over the water in a dory, which is a small boat. A woman in big waterproof boots clomps into the bait shop. Oh! The blast of a foghorn comes from the boat in the harbor. Creak! Behind a small gray house, the door of a fish shack opens. Tommy walks out with two yellow slickers and big waterproof pants that are crumpled and stained. His uncle Russ carries a bucket of fish heads and trimmings. Will we really go out today, says Tommy? Look at all this fog. Come on. Oh. The mournful tones of a foghorn reach Tommy and the brown dog as they follow Russ through the mist. I forgot to show you the picture of the village. And here's Tommy and his uncle Russ walking from the fish sack and down to the water. At the beach, the tide is very low. Russ unties the rowboat and drags it down to the water. When Tommy climbs in, the bottom of the boat squits scratches across the rocky ocean bed. We'll need more bait, says Russ, as he rows them away from the shore. Tommy points straight ahead through the fog. There she is, he says. There's our boat, the Nellie Jean. Well, we can't see it yet because of the fog. But we will get to see it. When everything on the lobster boat is stowed away, Russ pulls on his waterproof pants and warms up the diesel engine. Then he drives across the harbor to a long weathered dock. Old Sam and Ginny come out and help Tommy load two more buckets of fish bait. The storm brewing out there should go south, says old Sam. That's the report, replies Russ. We're going fishing. Old Sam rubs his fingers across the brim of his, his hat. Well, so am I, he says. 
Tommy coils the thick ropes that hold the boat. Go get him, says Ginny, as she and old Sam push the lobster boat away from the dock. There you can see the side where it's painted Nellie Jean. The Nellie Jean moves through the harbor. Scree, scree. The seagulls smell the bait in the buckets and fly in close. Scram, you rascal, says Tommy. We're too early for your breakfast. He covers the buskets, buckets with a yellow rain slicker. Rush pushes the throttle forward for extra speed and follows the ghostly shape of a big boat with towering masts and long dangling ropes. The woo, a woo, the foghorn sound. The lobster boat sways and totters in the deep waves churned up by the huge boat. The smell of diesel mingles with the everlasting odor of fish and sea. Flicker blink. The faint glow from the lighthouse reaches out through the fog to the Nelly Jane. Russ uses this to steer safely past jagged rocks that stick out above the sea. The boat jumps and jitters over the foamy waves that crash around the rocks. Carry Carefully, very carefully, Tommy pours out two cups of steaming hot cocoa. You can see the big boat in the back. Soon the fog does burn off and the bright blue green of the ocean glints in the sun sunlight. Scree, scree. More seagulls follow the Nelly Jean with noisy chatter. Russ lines up the boat with a distant white cliff to keep her headed in the right direction. Uncle Russ, Tommy shouts loudly into the wind. Are we going to move the traps into deeper water? Russ shakes his head. Not yet. Most of the lobsters seem to be moving across the gravel bottom, right by the traps we put in last week. Russ squints across the bright ocean as he guides the boat. Soon they pass a group of painted buoys that are tied to lobster traps under the sea. The red and white ones belong to the Jensen brothers. Old Sam paints his buoys with orange stripes. Tommy grins when he sees the ones painted yellow on top and red on the bottom. Everyone knows that these belong to the lobster crew of the Nelly Jean. Throttled back out of gear, Russ nudges the boat alongside their closest buoy. Getting ready to fish out of lobster trap. Tommy reaches out to hook the rope coming from the buoy. Russ slings it around the automatic winch and turns on the switch. Whirr. The winch grinds and groans, slowly pulling up a lobster trap that has been sitting on the gravel bottom 100 feet below the sea. The dripping rope brings water, seaweed, and a tiny crab into the boat. Scree, scree. 
seagulls come so close that Tommy feels a wing flap against his shoulder. When the trap reaches the surface, sur sur surface of the water, excuse me, Tommy pulls it to the railing of the deli jean. The trap is covered with furry sea growth and is slippery in his hands. Click, click. Reddish black lobster claws reach out through the wires and a pair of lobster antennas twitch in the salty sea air. Looks like we got ourselves a big one, Uncle Russ says. Tommy opens the back door of the trap and carefully grabs the lobster from behind. Click, click go the crusher and ripper claws. Click, clack, click. The lobster has all kinds of claws, long skinny ones, shorter fat ones, for all the ripping and tearing it does. Tommy's smart to keep his fingers away from that. Look at this female, Tommy says, loaded with eggs. Russ shows Tommy where to make a notch in her tail. No one will keep her now, he says, even when she isn't carrying eggs. Tommy puts the lobster back into the sea where she will protect her eggs for months and months until they are ready to hatch. Tommy reaches in for another lobster. Too small, says Russ. Click, click, splash. Another lobster goes back into the water. Tommy takes out the last one. Better measure it, says Russ. Tommy fits a brass gauge between the eye sockets and the end of the body shell. The lobster is three and a half inches long and big enough to keep. Russ slips a thick rubber band over each claw. The lobster squirms and squiggles, but the claws do not open. This lobster goes into a bucket of seawater. He's a keeper. Tommy takes the old bait from the trap and throws it into the air. Scree, scree, scree. Finally, the noisy seagulls get their breakfast. They swoop down and catch some of the soggy fish before it hits the water. Tommy uses the baiting iron to load new fish frames onto the bait string in the trap. I'll check the depth finder, says Russ. I don't want to drift away from that gravel bottom where all the lobsters seem to be traveling. Russ watches the gauge and pulls hard on the steering wheel to make a sharp turn. When he nods his head, Tommy pushes the freshly baited trap overboard. The lobster men move on from trap to trap. They work quickly and check 20, then 50, then more than 100 traps. They find two traps that are damaged, 
and replace them with new ones. As the warm sunny day turns blustery, Russ keeps a watchful eye on the darkening sky to the south. On the way to another trap, Russ gets a call on the radio. New weather report, says old Sam, who was fishing nearby. That squall has changed its mind and is headed right this way. Tommy looks over to see the dark clouds moving in fast. Both of them pull on yellow slickers and long oilcloth hats. Throttle full ahead, they start back to get back to the harbor ahead of the storm. A strong wind comes in to lash at the water and rattle through the wheelhouse. Waves swell up white and foamy, and Russ leans his whole body against the steering wheel to help keep it steady. Huddling, crashing, the full storm rages around the Nelly Jean. Seawater slaps the bow and pounds on the window. Tommy slips and slides across the deck as he ties down the traps and buckets. The pelting rain turns his fa face bright red. The boat groans and moans and rattles everywhere. Flicker blink. The double flash of the lighthouse reaches them through the drenching rain. As they near the harbor, the wind shifts and turns up the coastline. Gradually, the sea loses its white cho choppy whiteness and Tommy is able to stand up straight. He gets out a brush and pail and begins to clean up the lobster boat. Sea urchins, small crabs, and piles of dangling seaweed go back into the sea. The Nellie Jean looks clean and tidy as Russ steers her through a crowd of boats coming in from the storm. He p pulls the boat up to the lobster pound. Ginny is there to weigh the lobsters. The good news is that you caught more than old Sam, she says. The bad news is that the catch is high everywhere and so the price is down. Jenny decides to keep these lobsters in a lobster pound, a fenced-in cove where she will feed them for several months. In winter, when lobsters are hard to catch, Jenny can sell them for a higher price. She pays Russ and Tommy, and they get gas for the Nellie Jean, and tie her up to her moored moored in the harbor. Then they roll back to the gray house by the beach. Russ cooks something to eat. The smell of broiling steak mingles with that of sea air. Tommy sits on the back porch and weaves a new funnel-shaped door for an old trap. They listen to the latest weather report when they sit down to eat. Sunny and cool. Do you think the storm damaged many of our traps? asked Tommy. Maybe the shallow ones near the rocky ledge, says Russ. The rest are deeper and should be safe. It is dark again in the tiny town on the coast. Chains clank, boats creak, and sigh in the wind 
bright leaves rustle under the trees. Small waves swoosh and swish onto the beach. Only the flash of the lighthouse remains to keep watch over the harbor. Flicker, blink, flicker, blink. Soon it will be dawn and another day of lobstering for the crew of the Nellie Jean. Okay, I hope you enjoyed the book. I'll see you next time.